Io sogno una nazione nella quale tu, per essere un buon docente, non devi per forza avere la tessera della CGL. E allora è sotto attacco l'identità nazionale, è sotto attacco l'identità religiosa. È sotto attacco l'identità di genere, è sotto attacco l'identità familiare. Il 25 andiamo a votare e legge elettorale pessima. Almost exactly 100 years after Benito Mussolini's March on Rome, Italy has experienced a new rise of fascism. Giorgia Meloni emerged as the big winner of Italy's national elections and is now poised to become the new prime minister. Italy is in shock. Final results on last Monday showed her party winning about 26% of the vote. She now leads a right-wing coalition which has gathered 43%. Her party is seen as the heir of the fascist parties in Italy, and for good reasons. Conservative and so-called centrist pundits and politicians have downplayed, normalized, or celebrated her victory with great fervor. Hillary Clinton said about Meloni a while ago that the election of the first woman prime minister in a country is a good thing, emphasizing the girl boss element of modern fascism. We will later talk about what the Meloni government will mean for women in Italy. The expressed support both in Italy and internationally was massive and once again made us understand why Hitler and Mussolini had it relatively easy in their ascension to power. Last July, Italy experienced yet another collapse of its government, headed by former European Central Bank President and Governor of the Bank of Italy, Mario Draghi. Italy is known for changing governments every few years. Its politics are a mess. And the only major party that didn't participate in the technocratically formed Draghi coalition was Meloni's Fratelli d'Italia, Brothers of Italy in English. The FDI has seen a meteoric rise, going from being a fringe far-right force, only receiving 4% of votes four years ago, to becoming the most popular party in Italy with 26% today. This is partly due to the other right-wing parties, such as the Lega, to concede too much to the unpopular corrupt center, while the FDI could maintain ideological purity and thus reap the rewards today. More important causes to its rise will be discussed in this video. Due to the Italian political system, the right-wing alliance got 235 seats out of 400 in the Chamber of Deputies, so more than half despite getting less than half of the vote. Considering that 60% of eligible voters showed up, this means that this government represents less than 30% of the people, and the FDI about a tenth, which is still a tragedy. Fratelli d'Italia, the opening words of the national anthem, inspired the name of the new party. The FDI emerged out of the National Alliance Party, which was itself a successor of the Movimento Sociale Italiano, the MSI, founded by former officials loyal to Benito Mussolini. For initiates, MSI also stood for Mussolini sei immortale, Mussolini you are immortal. The tricolor flame in the party logo is supposed to be inspired by the eternal flame on Mussolini's tomb. We've talked about the MSI in my previous video on Italian fascism. They would become the fourth largest party in Italy and was involved with Operation Gladio and CIA meddling in Italian politics to crush the immensely strong communist movement with the most brutal methods. The symbolism and the MSI heritage are by far not the only reason people link the FDI to fascism. 
Georgia Meloni began her political engagement when she joined the fascist MSI at age 15. Under Berlusconi's center-right alliance, she became the youngest ever minister of Italy by getting the minister of youth position. Meloni and others later left Berlusconi's People of Freedom Party for its support of the then Prime Minister Mario Monti and not being right-wing enough, among other things, and created the Fratelli d'Italia in 2012. In 1996, she praised Mussolini. Moi, je crois que, que Mussolini, c'était un, un bon politicien. Tout ce qu'il a fait, il a fait pour l'Italie. People in defense of Meloni, of course, say that she was still very young. Well, 10 years later, she said in an interview that she had a, quote, light-hearted, unquote, relationship towards fascism and that she considered it part of Italian history. She said that Mussolini, quote, made some mistakes Historically, however, he had also created a lot, but this did not absolve him. Meloni numbers various Mussolini followers as her direct allies or idols, including the racist, anti-Semite Nazi collaborator Giorgio Almirante, who was the founder of the MSI. In the last video, we talked about how the US collaborated with the Italian state to spare all major fascist leaders and reintegrate them into the state structure. Italy never did proper defascistization. This is important in understanding why the fascist movement in Italy remains strong to this day. Her party in general does not do a good job to beat the fascist allegations, to put it mildly. Mussolini's granddaughter, Rachele Mussolini, is a prominent member of the Brothers of Italy, winning the most votes in Rome's council election last year. His other granddaughter, Alessandra Mussolini, was also active in right-wing Italian politics. Let's remember this funny interaction with Jim Carrey. Mussolini's great-grandson, humbly named Gaius Julius Caesar Mussolini, ran for office as a candidate of the Brothers of Italy. You can see how they made sure Mussolini takes up quite some space in this election poster. Written in a font that is popular in neo-Nazi and other violent fascist groups. This is a current FDI deputy and lawyer. And here we see another guy who was elected on the FDI list, posing in an SS uniform with a picture of Hitler behind him. Enrico Michetti is another prominent member who said that the Roman salute, or the fascist salute, should be revived during times of COVID to avoid the handshake. Meloni said in 2018 that the celebration of Liberation Day, a day commemorating Italy's liberation from fascism, and the day of the founding of the Italian Republic after the liberation, are, quote, two controversial celebrations and that they should be replaced with a day commemorating Italy's victory in World War I. An FDI chapter in central Italy celebrated the march on Rome in 2019. While the party distanced itself at first, Meloni minimized it in an interview and refused to kick openly fascist members out of the party. The FDI youth organization, Gioventù Nazionale, attracted attention by commemorating Waffen-SS standard-bearer and war criminal Leon de Grel. In a municipality near Rome, the FDI mayor erected a monument to Rodolfo Graziani, one of the worst war criminals of fascist Italy, who used poison gas in the war against Abyssinia and was responsible for the genocide in Cyrenaica during the Second Italian-Libyan War. The FDI specifically aimed to reach young fascist sympathizers on social media by using tags such as fascism. Meloni knew she needed to save face among the broader European ruling clique before the elections in September by saying she is pro-democracy. The Italian right has handed fascism over history for decades now, unambiguously condemning the suppression of democracy and the ignominious anti-Jewish laws, and equally 
An ambiguous, of course, is our condemnation of Nazism and communism, the latter being the sole totalitarian ideology of the 20th century that still is in power in some countries, surviving its tragic failures, and that the left has a hard time condemning, perhaps partly because it has received generous founding from the Soviet Union for decades. This was apparently enough to calm the concerns of many political analysts. Many anti-fascists from Italy, of course, voiced their doubts about the sincerity of this message, saying she's just campaigning for elections. Professor Emeritus of Italian Studies, Luciano Kelis, commented, quote, The video on Wednesday is so different from the speech she gave at Vox. She's cunning. Obviously, she adapts her appearance and attitude to the audience. Just two months earlier, she had given a speech at the Spanish far-right Vox rally in Marbella, making racist and queerphobic remarks. Will we see the return of a fascist system in Italy? What does the win of Meloni mean concretely for Italians and the future of European politics? And what are the connections of the FDI to openly violent fascist groups and a new secret fascist network manipulating Italian politics from the shadows? This video will try to answer these questions. Italy, located in the Mediterranean Sea in Europe, is the third most populous member state of the European Union, with over 60 million inhabitants. It has the ninth largest economy by nominal GDP and by national wealth in the world. It was not until the late 19th century when Italy roughly gained the borders it has today. Various states in the Italian peninsula managed to unite into a single state in 1861, the Kingdom of Italy. After the fall of the fascist regime, the fascist MSI became the main hub for far-right European currents. Various scholars have explained that one of the components that separates so-called neo-fascism from classical fascism is the emphasis on an international alliance. One instance of this is the European Social Movement established in 1951 at the initiative of the Italian MSI. It was a pan-European organization of fascist groups and figures such as fascist journalist Maurice Pardec from France and British fascist Oswald Mosley, a famous proponent of pro-European integration. Pardec wrote in 1961, quote, The famous fascist methods are constantly revised and will continue to be revised. More important than the mechanism is the idea which fascism has created for itself of man and freedom, with another name, another face, and with nothing which betrays the projection from the past. Bardek's strategy of disguise was implemented by the MSI in its policy of inserimento, insertion or entryism in English, which means to gain political acceptance through collaboration with parties in the democratic system. They, for instance, supported the Christian Democratic government in the late 50s, which sparked massive anti-fascist protests. Some historians say that this electoral strategy is nothing new, as Hitler worked within the political system as well, abiding by constitutional processes until centralizing state power. Just because a fascist hides their views, it does not mean they cease to be a fascist. The so-called neo-fascist leaders are always careful to not openly show their reactionary views. This is generally the case with far-right politics. Members of Haider's Freedom Party of Austria and Le Pen's National Front, for instance, do not openly express hate toward Jews as a group, but they would frequently focus on people which happened to be Jewish. Today's fascists do not appear in boots and brown shirts but often in suits and ties. They have to appeal to a modern electorate, to move with the times. The more optimistic historian Stanley G. Payne claimed that fascism has no chance to become mainstream under a, quote, strengthened democracy, unquote, in Europe. That neo-fascist groups could only achieve victory by moderating their stances. Obviously, Mr. Payne's viewpoint seems a little naive, to say the least, 
Considering the fact that fascists have always used disguise and dishonesty as key tactics to appeal to an electorate, it is also superficial in the idealist sense, since the strategy of fascism has to be seen within a materialist political context. From a Marxist point of view, one of the key pillars of fascism is to stop the working class from taking power through an openly violent dictatorship of the bourgeoisie as opposed to a more hidden dictatorship of the bourgeoisie under liberal democracy. So it makes sense that the seeming moderation of fascism goes along with the weakening of the working class movement. Anti-communism was the key motivator of fascist groups in the 60s and 70s, just like it had been in Mussolini's time. After the 80s, the global context began to change quickly. Communist or nominally communist governments began to dissolve. The Italian Communist Party became openly social democratic and reorganized in 1991 as the Democratic Party of the Left. The Socialist Party had fully succumbed to capitalism long ago. In the same year, a new party, one that would become influential in today's politics, the Lega Nord, Northern League, was created. A reactionary bunch who have demanded independence of the so-called productive North from the quote, lazy African South. Its racist leader, Matteo Salvini, has been the face of the Italian far right, but is now ceding his limelight position to Giorgia Meloni. The Lega Nord has been key in the rise of the far right. It introduced the tirade against identity politics or political correctness in Italy. It's been labeled right populist, while the Brothers of Italy are labeled neo-fascist by the media. Populism is a highly misused and vague word in politics. Populism, at best, can be described as a rhetoric rather than a coherent ideology. More often than not, it's a cheap attempt by liberal commentators to lump in right-wing movements with left-wing movements. And while the Lega Nord is not the same as the FDI, it definitely serves the Meloni agenda. Along with the disappearing communist threat, fascists moderated some of their approach, many of them seeking to integrate in liberal democracy. Among them was Gianfranco Fini, leader of the moderate wing of the MSI, who argued for seeking alliances with other conservative parties. The MSI transformed into the Alianza Nazionale, National Alliance in English, in 1995, and fused with Silvio Berlusconi's Forza Italia into the People of Freedom in 2009. Pino Rauti, leader of the radical wing of the MSI, who regarded Fini as a traitor, co-founded the Fiamma Tricolore, Tricolored Flame. Openly defending its fascist legacy, it focused on propaganda against globalization. The Fiamma was by far not the only openly fascist formation. It competed with the Forza Nuova, New Force, which was founded by former members of the Avanguardia Nazionale in 1997. One of the founders, Roberto Fiore, who had fled to Britain to avoid being jailed for the Bologna massacre, had learned there to recruit among the hooligan scene. It gained significant control over the right-wing Lazio football club, but also established an influence among traditionally left-wing clubs such as AC Roma. Most Italian football team fan clubs are highly influenced by the fascist group, which is among the reasons the football fan culture in Italy is ripe with racism and violence. Other prominent and newer fascist groups were the Militia, a fiercely anti-Semitic organization, and Casa Pound, the name referring to the American writer Ezra Pound, who was a follower of Mussolini. The Casa Pound members called themselves fascists of the third millennium, signaling their innovative approach, for instance, being highly involved in alternative music, establishing a film club, or heavily focusing on social media and recruiting young members. However, the most influential so-called neo-fascist group today, formed in 2012 by former members of the Alianza Nazionale, out of a right-wing split with Berlusconi's party, is Giorgia Meloni's Fratelli d'Italia. Meloni endorses the Great Replacement Theory, and she also believes in the Calergi Plan, 
a far-right anti-Semitic conspiracy theory which says that Austrian-Japanese politician Richard von Kudenhof Kalergi made a plot to mix white Europeans with other races through immigration. Aside from that, she is extremely xenophobic, Islamophobic and homophobic. During a TV show in 2016, she said she would, quote, rather not have a gay child. She supports the Opus Dei, an institution by the Catholic Church arguing against any social position outside the traditional positions endorsed by the Catholic Church. Hence, it is no surprise she supports the anti-gender movement, which stems from Opus Dei circles. Meloni said she would change the constitution to prohibit LGBTQ plus families and only support traditional families. FDI members have called the Black Lives Matter protests an absolutist and fanaticist movement. For them, the leaders of the social democratic Partito Democratico are collaborators, undermining Italy's sovereignty and national identity on behalf of foreign powers and the quote LGBTQ lobby. To this end, they would bring foreigners into the country en masse, propagate rainbow diversity and thus endanger the natural order. The Italian far right sees itself in a final struggle against the nation's progressive decline, necessitating a national rebirth won by patriots. For the British historian Roger Griffin, this vision of redemption is a core part of the fascist worldview. Meloni gained a boost during the Covid pandemic, where she, among other things, doubted the need for social distancing. It is well known that Italy has always had a vicious approach to its southern borders and does not respect refugees and migrants' rights in general. Under a Meloni government, all of this will worsen dramatically. The FDI wants a zero-tolerance policy on illegal immigration, and for this, they want to erect a naval blockade and issue fines for NGO rescue vessels. While blocking migrants from reaching Italy's ports, the FDI wants to boost the birth rate of Italian nationals to reduce the demand of migrant labor. Her coalition partner Salvini has not much different views. Meloni once argued it would be better to just sink migrant rescue boats. Like other European far-right leaders, Meloni is opposed to a federal Europe and proposes a confederal Europe of nations, but through strong independent nation-states. And Meloni has definitely indicated she would want to break with the EU, but this does not mean that she wouldn't be in favor of a united, more right-wing Europe. Mainstream commentators like to depict the far-right as Eurosceptic. But that hasn't been necessarily the case historically. Think of Oswald Mosley or prominent Nazi members who strongly argued for European integration. The FDI program pledges to respect Italy's commitments to the NATO. Their conservative alliance has pledged its, quote, full adherence to the process of European integration. The FDI has strong ties to other far-right parties, such as Vox in Spain. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban and Meloni have declared strong reciprocal sympathy. The FDI is also allied with the ultra-right Polish Law and Justice Party in the European Parliament. The FDI has also requested to change the constitution. But this would be only possible if their coalition commands a two-thirds majority in parliament. There is a real possibility of this happening. Many centrist, pseudo-skeptic voices in Italy fall for the fact that since Meloni is the first ever woman to be elected as Italian prime minister, it must mean that her success is positive for women in Italy. The declared anti-feminist FDI has voted in the past against proposals to protect women from violence and discrimination because they are against, quote, gender ideology. Less than half of all women have a job in Italy and that gap is likely going to widen since Meloni promised to cut taxes for larger families and in general to incentivize and boost the birth rate. Already in some regions where the right parties rule, 
People are being paid to not abort and anti-abortion groups have been allowed into hospitals. And what about all the women without Italian citizenship anyway? Just recently, Meloni tweeted a video of a girl getting raped to make the point that immigrants are bad. What about the working class? Many seem to be infatuated by the idea that Meloni is an anti-establishment candidate. Potrei farne tante altre di queste domande. A monte c'è quella che ci facciamo oggi, perché la famiglia è un nemico? Perché la famiglia fa così paura? C'è una risposta unica per tutte queste domande. Perché ci definisce, perché è la nostra identità. Perché tutto quello che ci definisce in questo tempo è un nemico. Per chi vorrebbe che non avessimo più un'identità e che, fossero, che fossimo solamente schiavi, consumatori perfetti. E allora è sotto attacco l'identità nazionale, è sotto attacco l'identità religiosa, è sotto attacco l'identità di genere, è sotto attacco l'identità familiare. Non devo potermi definire italiana, cristiana, donna, madre, no. Io devo essere cittadino X, genere X, genitore 1, genitore 2, devo essere un numero. Perché quando sarò solamente un numero, quando non avrò più un'identità, quando non avrò più radici, beh, allora sarò lo schiavo perfetto in balia della grande speculazione finanziaria, il consumatore perfetto. Finally, someone who stands up to the financial speculators, globalists like George Soros and the Great Reset. The joint manifesto of the Meloni-Berlusconi-Salvini alliance declared it will cut taxes, crack down on immigration, and get rid of the current system of welfare benefits, without specifying exactly what they mean by this. Although we got a glimpse of this just days after her victory, where the Meloni party confirmed it will do away with the subsidy for the poor, a measly 500 euros on average for those without a job. While the Fratelli d'Italia likes to pose as a pro-worker party, their policies tell a different story, as does their funding. Oil lobbyists, US multinationals and ultra-right groups, or a Roman entrepreneur investigated for illicit financing, are among the list of the money givers. Doesn't really sound like she's struggling against foreign interference. Meloni is a member of the Aspen Institute, a think tank headquartered in Washington, D.C., which also includes many of the financial speculators she mentioned. She doesn't exactly sound like an anti-establishment candidate now, does she? Meloni already indicated several times what she thinks of working class organizations. The largest workers' union in Italy, the CGIL, is the only larger, relatively left-wing union. Meloni recently said, Io sogno una nazione nella quale tu, per essere un buon docente, non devi per forza avere la tessera della CGL. The CGIL is a special target for the far right. Just last year, its headquarters was assaulted by the Forza Nuova, which Meloni refuses to condemn but more on that later. These rants and violent attacks against trade unions, of course, reminds us of the times of Mussolini and the black shirts, violent attacks against working class organizations, and the abolition of the freedom to join a union under their rule. We are reminded of the pseudo-revolutionary rhetoric of Mussolini or the Nazis, who said they were against the liberal elite, and in the end, supported the same ruling class as the previous governments. And this is intentional, because it needs to undermine the genuinely anti-capitalist movement, diverting people away from communist, class-conscious politics, to a movement that keeps the current power structure, revolutionary rhetoric, counter-revolutionary substance. And we need to understand what it is to be able to explain it to other people so they won't fall for it. That's why the fascist fighting squads emerged in Italy, funded by the big landowners and industrialists during times of socialist uprising and worker strikes. And that's why the Freikorps, the movement that led to the Nazi party, were organized in Germany to fight the communists that were on the verge of taking power. Same with the fascist grey wolves in Turkey or the Contras in Nicaragua. Many say that while there might be fascists in the party, Meloni herself isn't one. Well, doesn't that sound reassuring? And what does that say about someone anyway?
as they say in Germany, if there's a Nazi at the table and 10 other people sitting there hanging out with him, you got a table with 11 Nazis. But we are not so much interested in this individual, but the political current she and her party represent, and the system that allows for such depraved people to even have a slight chance at success. Meloni of course doesn't disavow her openly fascist members. She recently said, quote, There is no place for racists, anti-Semites and neo-Nazis at the Fratelli d'Italia, conveniently failing to mention fascists. Many liberal commentators play down a Brothers of Italy victory. And I don't know about you, but even a single day of a fascist or fascist sympathizer ruling in one municipality is too much and shows how something is fundamentally wrong with the political system. All this does is to justify the bourgeois democratic system and its obvious inability to deal with a rising fascist movement. Of course they have to say this, because the rise of Meloni clearly points to something fundamentally wrong with the current political system, sullying the seeming glory and stability of quote, Western democracy. The rise of fascism goes hand in hand with the normalization of its ideas and the voices telling you to not overreact. We are reminded of the New York Times publishing fawning articles about Hitler or Winston Churchill praising Mussolini, just like much of the upper classes in Britain and elsewhere, calling him the Roman genius and saying that fascism has quote, rendered a service to the whole world. But the fascist movement is here, and it is growing. Italian newspaper Fanpage conducted a bombshell investigation through an infiltrated journalist, which led to the revelation of multiple important FDI members making anti-Semitic and racist remarks, and openly praising fascism, including member of the European Parliament Carlo Fidanza, the investigation revealed a network labeled the Black Lobby, headed by Italian fascist and real estate businessman Roberto Yonghi Lavarini, also known as the Black Baron. He once said, quote, Mussolini's only true mistake is that he was too good. A former candidate for the Fratelli d'Italia, he has also been involved with proudly fascist groups such as Fiamma Tricolore and was a founder of Cuore Nero Black Heart, an association located near the cemetery of Mussolini. In spite of these connections, he has held institutional positions for years, such as heading a municipality of Milan. His movement Fare Fonte face and resist is now merged with the Brothers of Italy party, after years of letting a known fascist run without consequences. He got convicted in 2020 for fascist sympathizing and is now forced to be more secretive in his organizing and messaging. The secret network of the Black Baron includes supporters of Alexander Dugin, former members of the Propaganda Due, or according to him, a group of Hitler admirers. In addition, it is linked to former military and secret service people. Among the goals of the Black Lobby is to get votes for and illicitly fund the far right in parliament. The funding is allegedly coming in part from the openly fascist groups, which expect to have their favors reciprocated. The footage shows FDI member of European Parliament Carlo Fidanza, who is seen making salutes like these. The Black Baron has supported the election of FDI members, such as Chiara Valcepina, who is seen doing the Roman salute and the gladiator handshake. The recordings also show the members' acceptance of neo-Nazi presence and the way they used the word patriot as a cleaner stand-in word for fascist. Relations between openly fascist groups such as Casa Pound and the FDI had always been close. Casa Pound is part of a right-wing network of businesses, including apparel store chains, software startups, barber shops, offshore companies or real estate companies. So it is only natural that a secretive network would facilitate illicit financing to boost the strength of the FDI.
As the brothers of Italy have gotten stronger, Casa Pound started losing importance by beginning to bleed members into the FTI. Unsurprisingly, the Fratelli d'Italia did not distance itself from this. Local party chapters and their members never failed to show their nostalgia for fascism, such as when municipal councillor, who received the highest number of votes in Rome, Nicola Franco, proudly showed his library with works glorifying the Nazi and fascist period. Meloni has repeatedly failed to distance her party from violent fascist actions, like murders of migrants, attacks on minorities, or political opponents, such as last year when Forza Nuova leaders stormed the CGIL trade union headquarters. She refused to take a stance because of, quote, not knowing the matrix of these acts. Well, the matrix of it was clear to everyone. The event shocked Italy. Several protesters displayed the swastika tattoo and fascist slogans on t-shirts. This is reminiscent of the fascist paramilitaries in Mussolini's time, who attacked unions or any organization close to the socialist movement. This goes to show that fascist violence does not have to wait for a left social and political movement to be strong. It also shows that not every fascist has to be directly involved in these attacks. Mussolini back then represented the parliamentary wing of the fascist movement, while the black shirts did the dirty work. And by failing to condemn these, one could say that Meloni is putting herself in the parliamentary wing of the new rise of fascism in Italy. There is not a single explanation to why the far right has seen a resurgence. However, they pretty much all relate to capitalism. Certainly one cause many analysts mention is the so-called financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. The debt crisis has struck Italy especially hard, and it hasn't recovered ever since. The crisis ensued the pursuit of the EU and its members to implement austerity measures and deficit control, which intensified inequality, making the rich richer and the poor poorer. The situation is worsened by the tendency of the high-income imperialist countries to outsource industrial jobs to low-income countries, thus also reducing the areas in which working-class organization has been strong. Clara Zetkin wrote that fascism is, quote, an expression of the decay and disintegration of the capitalist economy. We can combat fascism only if we grasp that it rouses and sweeps along broad social masses who have lost the earlier security of their existence. However, many far-right people are relatively well off economically. They often stem from the petty bourgeoisie, i.e. are small business owners, for instance. What they fear is either missing out on growing their business or being crushed by the big bourgeoisie, monopolies who edge them away. The capitalist state's inability, or rather unwillingness, to solve people's most urgent needs and the according corruption of the mainstream liberal and conservative parties, who first and foremost serve the needs of monopoly capital, lies at the heart of this. More and more people are starting to lose hope in the liberal democratic system. The Italian people have witnessed the most blatant corruption over the past decades. The ruling parties, from the so-called center-left to the center-right, have all experienced a rapid decline in popularity. Anti-establishment sentiment explodes. That's where the fascist movement has historically come in, to utilize that frustration before the communists grow stronger. A survey conducted in Germany revealed that a majority who supports the far-right AFD party do so out of spite for the other party's corruption and inefficacy. Quote, it is in the interests of the most reactionary circles of the bourgeoisie that fascism intercepts the disappointed masses who desert the old bourgeois parties. Fascism fills the emptiness and blandness of liberal democracy with reactionary ideology, channeling people's grievances into the hope of an improvement through national rebirth. So, as soon as there is a capitalist crisis, and you could argue we are in one, capitalism needs a narrative to intercept a growing class consciousness. 
So instead of blaming the rich, it is the race, the nation, the cultural identity, so-called globalists, Jewish bankers, the LGBTQ lobby, or immigrants, and so on. Now this is not speculation. We know from documents how industrialists in Germany made exactly this point in their reasoning to fund the Nazis. While Meloni likes to present herself as anti-establishment to grow her movement, she has frequently defended Berlusconi's third cabinet, for instance, such as when it passed laws that benefited Berlusconi's companies. Quote, Those are laws that Silvio Berlusconi made for himself, but they are perfectly fair laws. The recent explosion in energy prices, inflation in general, are also the result of the inherent contradictions of capitalism-imperialism. The inevitable mix of cultures through globalization, or the increased freedom of movement within the EU, incites the latent national chauvinism of large sections of the peoples of Europe and their fears of being replaced all perpetuated by the billionaire-owned papers who divert people's attention away from the real problems. Researchers found that in virtually every country that a majority who votes for far-right parties think that there are too many immigrants in their country and that they are the reason for many problems. If the xenophobia and racism is already this big today, one can only imagine how this will develop in the future when more and more people have to flee their homes due to the climate catastrophe and move to places predominantly located in the global north where global warming is not as devastating. A study projects that 700 million climate refugees will be on the move by 2050. But capitalism has a solution for this. It obviously can stop its destruction of the environment and the exploitation of the global south. It will instead intensify its brutal border policy, creating an even more fertile soil for the emergence of fascism. Will we see fascism in Italy with the victory of Meloni? For fascism to be realized, it needs to upend the liberal democratic system. It needs to become an open dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. In the usual liberal definition, fascism is often described as something irrational, masterminded by a narcissist dictator, as an accident of history. The relation to capitalism is not made, of course, to keep the capitalist system sanitized. Class is only marginally mentioned, yet class and capitalism are key to the emergence of fascism, once you understand this, you will see this pattern everywhere. Quote, Fascism is the strongest, most concentrated and classic expression at this time of the world bourgeoisie's general offensive, wrote Clara Zetkin in 1923. What this means concretely can be expressed by three characteristics. It implies a radical, counter-revolutionary element, that is, to negate the liberal democratic government in fundamental ways, to centralize it, put the executive above all else, and organize the economy around free market principles and the corporatization of society, intensified suppression of political opponents and the defeat of working class organization in particular. I think it is unlikely that the already compromised Italian liberal democratic system will be abolished within the next three to five years, but it does need to yet. Capitalism still enjoys relative stability in Europe. The workers' movement is relatively weak, although that is changing quickly. Also, fascism does not need to come abruptly. However, as soon as either the working class movement becomes stronger or the economic crisis escalates, it will have further consolidated its forces. The FDI has already proven itself as a mainstream party, and the fascist networks will rapidly gain in resources. Quote, in short, democracy organized fascism when it felt it could no longer resist the pressure of the working class in conditions even of only formal freedom. Fascism does not need to wait for a socialist movement to grow strong. It can suffocate it in its tracks. Quote, before the establishment of a fascist dictatorship, 
Bourgeois governments usually pass through a number of preliminary stages and adopt a number of reactionary measures which directly facilitate the accession to power of fascism. Whoever does not fight the reactionary measures of the bourgeoisie and the growth of fascism at these preparatory stages is not in a position to prevent the victory of fascism, but on the contrary, facilitates that victory. Here we must remind ourselves that fascism has historically not arisen out of a revolution. The ruling class in both Germany and Italy virtually handed power to Hitler and Mussolini. They faced little to zero resistance. Even if a fascist government doesn't realize itself, we have to keep in mind that its movement is already having an impact. Just a couple of weeks ago, Alika Ogorciukwu, a black street vendor from North Italy, was brutally murdered. The rise of the far-right hate crimes is undoubtedly linked to the anti-immigrant rhetoric spread by Italian politicians. 300,000 migrants remain without documentation, exacerbating their situation and leaving them vulnerable to abuses. It's important to remember that whether or not fascism comes, the anti-worker pro-finance capital politics of the Draghi government will survive for quite a while. The capitalist system under liberal democracy is already a horror for the working class. The European border policy is already a huge crime. Women, the LGBTQ community, and members of different nationalities already face harsh oppression and discrimination. There is no time to waste. People need to hear the real answer to their problems. Reaction needs to have a real counterforce. Quote, if you do not interfere in politics, politics will eventually interfere in your life. History has shown that the ruling classes will not shy away from handing power to fascism. The failure of communist and other progressive forces to properly organize and act is the flip side of this tragedy. And this was no different 100 years ago. Quote, the proletariat did not succeed in unifying in a united organization for a common struggle to take power. The Italian bourgeoisie seized on this fact and set out to do this in its own right. And this is an enormous problem. The ruling class built an organization to defend the power that it holds, pursuing a unified plan for an anti-proletarian capitalist offensive. Whether or not a fascist system will be installed in Italy, the rise of Meloni and the popularity of the Fratelli d'Italia shows that the fascist movement is alive and well, and when the time comes, the Italian ruling class will, without a doubt, allow fascism to secure and consolidate the rule of the capitalist class. The new rise of fascism in Italy further proves that as long as there is private ownership of the means of production, fascism will always find its way to the top. And when the working class takes power in Italy, it will make sure that the fascist organizations will be utterly defeated and banned from ever existing again. <laughs>